Welcome back to my tutorials on how to use AnyRail. Now this time out, we are going to tackle the AnyRail Helix tool. Now at the time I am posting this video, there is no Video 34. And the reason for that is Video 34 really kicked my butt while I was trying to work it out. It was a good example of AnyRail doing whatever it wanted and not repeating the same results twice. Hopefully Video 34 will be done sometime, but uh, I just had to walk away from it for now. So let's talk about how to design a Helix using AnyRail. Now first off, I have never designed a Helix. I built one long ago, but it was from a published track plan. I played with AnyRail's Helix design tool when I first got the program, and I kind of walked away scratching my head. So to do this video, I looked at my books, and I did some research online, and I found a really good Helix calculator and a description of Helix design at modelbuildings.org. And here's their webpage, and I recommend that you go and check this out, because there's a lot of good information that they have here. Here's their calculator. Here's their description of what you need to put into their calculator. And down here, they talk about how to understand the results of what the calculator gives you. Now, I used their calculator to check what AnyRail was doing, and then I modified the results to match not only what modelbuildings.org recommended, but also what I felt was necessary for Helix design. Now, the results from the AnyRail and modelbuildings.org calculators do not always match, so don't get sidetracked if you get different numbers from the modelbuildings.org calculator and the AnyRail tool. Hopefully, I have given you enough information in this video and the next one to get you started designing helixes of your own. I have included a link to the modelbuildings.org site in the description below, and I suggest you check them out and really read their description of helix design. I also want to point out I'll not be demonstrating the modelbuildings.org calculator in this video. I think by the time I am done with my explanations of the AnyRail Helix tool, you'll be able to use the modelbuildings.org calculator on your own and understand the results you get from it. Now, some of you know what a Helix is. And for those of you new to model railroading who are probably not familiar with the term, I'll give you my less than expert description. A helix is simply a way to raise the track level of your railroad using stacked circles of track that have a steady grade. Here's an example of a helix I designed in AnyRail. It has four loops of track, as you can see, and it has a steady grade of 2.2%. The train can enter down here and then circle around, moving up steadily, and then exit up here. And in this example, the distance between where the train went in to where the train came out is 20 inches. By using a helix, you can easily go from one level of a multi-level railroad to another using a hidden helix instead of a long straight piece of track. For example, suppose you want to raise your track up 12 inches in height and have a grade of 2%. To find the length of track you would need, you would use the formula 12 inches divided by 0.02. 0.02 being 2%. As you can see in this drawing, for that grade percentage, you would require a run of 600 inches or 50 feet of track. For a lot of us, a straight run of track like this would circle our entire layout room. Using a helix like this one down here, I can do that rise of 12 inches using a 48 inch diameter loop of track or multiple loops of track. As you can see, we start our helix at zero inches. That's where the train goes in, and it circles around and around up four loops of track, and then comes out here 12 inches higher than it went in. So 2% constant grade. The diameter of my helix is 48 inches, which means I'm using 24 inch radius track in this example. So to start our design on paper, we would want to know the length of track per ring or the circumference of each ring. Now we know our run of track is 600 inches. So what we would do is we would divide 600 inches by four, and that equals 150 inches per ring. Now to get our diameter, we would divide 150 inches, which is our circumference, by 3.14, or pi, to get our diameter. And that comes out to 47.7 .7 inches. Now we're going to round that 47.7 inches to 48 inches. And of course, to get our radius, we would divide 48 by 2, and that gives us a radius of 24 inches for our track. 
So let's check our math. We have four rings. Each ring is going to rise three inches for our target height of 12 inches. So what we'll do is we will divide the rise for each ring, which is three inches, by 0 0.02, which is our target gradient. And we see that equals 150 inches per ring. We're right back where we started. Now, there are other factors to Helix design that we will talk about, and these factors do not appear to be considered by the NARAIL program. The modelbuildings.org calculator does take these other factors into account, and I suggest you use their calculator with the AnyRail tool to achieve the final result that you want. Now, it's probably going to be a lot of back and forth. Plug in this value, plug in that value, get mad, walk away, come back, get mad again, and just keep trying again until you finally get the helix you want. So let's go back to our blank drawing. Now we're going to start with a 10 foot square drawing space. Why? Well, it's because helix, as you're going to see, can get pretty darn big. Now we're going to add a piece of track. Now you can build a helix out of sectional track or flex track, but I'm going to use sectional track. So let me go grab a piece of track and we'll drag it over here. And we're going to make this a 90 degree curve with a 24 inch radius. So we'll right click, come down here, curve flex, 90 degrees for the angle and 24 for the radius. And there we go. Now I'm going to pull it over a little bit like that. Now we want to make a helix. I can either, if you're on the track tab, and you probably are after you've selected a piece of track, you can come up here and you can click here that says create helix. Or I can come down here and I can right click and I can create a helix from here. So let's click on create helix. And this little dialog box pops up. Now for our example, our starting point of our helix is going to be at zero inches. And our ending point is going to be at 12 inches. In the real world, you will probably want more than 12 inches, but 12 inches is a good number to use for our example. Next, it's going to ask for the number of loops. Now, we decided that we want four loops. So we're going to type in four here. Now, you notice when I clicked in there, slope percentage went from zero to a red 8%. And the reason it did that is my maximum grade is set to 3% in my settings. And you also notice that height per turn went to 12, which would make sense because right now we only have one turn in the helix. Also note that you can make the direction of the helix run either clockwise or counterclockwise. We'll use clockwise for all of our examples. So let's go in here and we're going to type in four. And you'll notice nothing changes down here. It doesn't update. Now I can see what my slope is going to be by clicking somewhere else. Now I'll click up here at the start point. And you'll notice it now says four, two percent for my slope and height per turn of three, which is exactly what we calculated. All right, let's go ahead and click OK. And there's our helix. But wait, how do you know you actually created a helix? It sort of looks just like a circle, doesn't it? Well, here's one way you can do it. Go up here to Home and click 3D View. Now you can see what it actually looks like. Let me zoom out a little bit on it and I can spin it around and I can do all sorts of things with it. And we haven't gone over 3D, how to use the 3D, but it, it's pretty easy. Now, one thing you might want to do is you might want to come up here and lose the ground. And that makes looking at your helix a little bit easier. So go ahead, scroll around, admire its beauty. And when you get tired of that, let's go back to the 2D view. Okay, so now we have this nice little helix here. We know it's a helix because we looked at it in 3D. But let me zoom in a little bit on it. Just like that. I don't see any details on my helix. Now, you may have details showing on your helix, depending on what you have set up in your uh, settings tabs. But for those of you who don't have anything showing, I'm going to show you how to get that. So let's go up here and click on Show, and we're going to turn on Height. And now you'll see you've got some numbers here. So up here you can see a 12 easily down here. You can see 10 and a half. It looks like it's saying 8 and 3 quarters, maybe over here, and who knows what it's saying over here.
And we'll talk about how to get those to be a little more clear in just a second. Let's also turn on slope percentages. And now you can see that it says our helix is running at a 2% grade. I could also turn on vertical clearance, but that just sort of confuses everything. So we'll leave that off for right now. Now let's try and make these numbers a little easier to see. So I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go to File. And I'm going to go to Options. And then I'm going to come over here and I'm going to click on Text. And I get this dialog box popping up. So I'm going to move this over so we can see what happens in real time. Now in Text, I can change the font of part numbers, labels, slope percentage, all that kind of stuff. And there's these other little boxes here, and I'll explain those in just a second. Now you can see that I have both my height and my slope percentage set to Arial Rounded MT Bold. Well, actually, this one is Arial Black, isn't it? This is my favorite font, so I probably should set that one to the same. But anyway, let's change our slope percentage to something else. So we'll click here. And let's find something that looks good. I'm going to select Bowl B1 SC. And now watch my number up here when I select this. You'll notice it changed. So this is actually looking much better here. It's a little bit easier to see, but it's still kind of crowded down here. Now there's two other things I can do. I have small checked here. I can uncheck small, and now it gets gigantic, and I can do that for both. And you'll notice these numbers are all jumbled up because it's looking at every layer of your helix. For me, I think these might be a little bit too big, so I'm going to go back to small. You can do whatever you want. But I'm going to turn on shield, and watch what happens to my slope percentage. Now get that little box around it. I'm going to do the same thing for height. I got a little box around it and it cleared it up. It's only showing me the height for the top level of my helix. Now I'm also going to turn on shield for vertical clearance because we might use that later on. Okay, we'll hit done. And now we can see what we have a lot more clearly. So like I pointed out, this looks nice now. We can read the numbers, but we can still only see the numbers for the top loop of our helix. Now, of course, the grade is going to remain the same throughout the helix, but these numbers are going to change depending on what level of the helix it is. So how do we see the height at different points in our helix? Well, the short answer is, I really don't know. But I can do this. I can come over here and I can highlight my entire helix. Make sure everything turns green. Come in, select anywhere on the helix, doesn't matter. Right click, come down, and hit details. And this box will pop up. And unfortunately, you can't resize this box. It'd be nice if you could, but you can't. So now I have a list of each piece of track in my helix. It's X, Y coordinates, that's these numbers, right here, and the beginning and ending heights. Here's the beginning height of one piece of track, and here's that piece of track's ending height. But you'll note, if you look at the beginning and ending heights of different pieces of track in this list, that they're all mixed up. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later in the video. So now, I could probably work from this. I could come down here and I could print it, and it will give me my list of track and the height or I can save it. And you can give it a name and it's going to save as a .txt file. And you can see up here, I've already done that in working out what I was going to do in this video. So let me hit cancel instead of save. And I'm going to close this guy out for now, but we're going to talk about this uh, in more detail later on. Okay, I'm going to drag this drawing down just a tiny bit to get some working room here. Now let's add some track going into and out of our helix. So I'm going to come over and I'm going to grab two pieces of flex. Now the easiest way I've found to add track to the helix is just grab a piece of track and move it till you see the blue ball and let it go. Kind of like this. There we go. I'm going to let it go. 
and it's going to snap somewhere on our helix. Now I'll grab the other piece of track and do the same thing, and it's going to snap to the other end of our helix. You're done. Let's take a look at that in 3D. We'll lose the ground. And there we go. And you can see we now have track going into and out of our helix. Okay, let's go back to our 2D view. Now, when I attach the first piece of track, I said it's going to attach somewhere. And what I meant was this. Let me undo this here. Now I can take this piece of track and I can attach it to my helix. And sometimes it will snap to the bottom of the helix. Let's try it again. And it's going to keep doing it for me. And sometimes it will snap to the top of the helix. Now I can find no rhyme or reason why any rail does this. So my best advice is to just attach one piece of track and let it snap to wherever any rail wants to snap it to, and then just attach the other piece of track. So let me lose these two pieces of track that we just put in. And I'm going to move this back up here. So now we have this beautiful helix that we made. But we need to know more details before we call it done and start laying down track. Now I model in HO, so that's what I'm going to use as an example. Let's go back to 3D. I'm going to zoom in on our 3D model here, and I'm just going to drag it a little bit like this. Try and get it to be, try and get it to look pretty clear. Okay, let's try that. Now, my tallest engine or rolling stock clocks in at just over two inches high from the top of the rail head to the top of the car. So we need to take into account the height of everything that makes up a turn of our helix. Now, looking at the 3D view, you really don't get too much information. Our helix tool said there is three inches of separation between the turns of our helix. And looking at the 3D view here, it looks like there is some kind of roadbed underneath our track. So I'm trying to figure out where this three inches that any rail is measuring is. So are they talking about it's three inches from the top of the rail that you can see here? Let's zoom in a little bit more. Is it three inches from here to here? Or is it three inches from here, the top of the rail head, to the bottom of our road bit? Or is it three inches from the bottom of this road bed to the bottom of this road bed? Any rail does not specify this. So let's do a little more digging into details. I'm going to go back to 2D view. And I'm going to open up the details on this helix. So here are the details of our helix that any rail will give us. And I'm going to scroll down here. And as you can see, the last piece of track in our helix has a starting height of 11 and 1 quarter inches and an ending height of 12 inches. That's a rise of 3 quarter inches. Now that 3 quarter inch holds true through our entire helix. So if we count back four pieces, one, two, three, four, we see that the start of this turn is at 9 inches. This means there are 3 inches between the helix levels, but that's not the whole story. So let's take a look at some of the construction details of a helix that we're going to need. Now, I just want to point out that the details that you are seeing here are the details I did get from AnyRail, but I put them into Microsoft Word, and I fixed it for clarity, and I'll talk about that in the next video. So let's take a look at a drawing I made in FastCAD. This shows the components of a helix turn, and I used the three inches that AnyRail came up with. And as you can see, I made two different measurements here. I made one from the bottom of the ties to the bottom ties, bottom or top of railhead to top of railhead. I also used a rolling stock height of two inches, but then I added a quarter of an inch just to give that dimension a little bit more wiggle room. So it's now 2.25 inches from railhead to the top of my rolling stock. And as you can see here, there is just about six tenths of an inch between the top of my rolling stock and the bottom of my track. That's not really a lot of room. 
But our helix is more than just track. Most of us have some type of road bed under our track, and that's usually cork road bed. So here's another drawing I made that shows cork road bed underneath my track. Now cork road bed, if I looked it up right, has a thickness of around 0.19 inch, or for you metric folk, about 5 millimeters. Then you have to add in the thickness of your plywood base right here. And I used one half inch as an example. Also, if you use, say, quarter round plywood sections to make up a helix turn, meaning that there are four 90 degree pieces of plywood in each helix turn, there will also be a joint plate connecting them together somewhere here where you have your plywood connected together. Now, I didn't show that joint plate on my CAD drawings for clarity, but remember, that plate will be there and you have to take it into account for your clearances. So what this means is if we keep our three inch rail head to rail head spacing, as you can see here, our rolling stock will not be able to pass underneath the plywood of the next level helix turn. And it doesn't matter where you measure this. I'm measuring here from top of my plywood to top of my plywood, and this one is top of railhead to top of railhead. But that only gives me 2.160 inches from the top of the railhead to the bottom of the plywood of the helix turn above it. And with our two and a quarter inch rolling stock height, I think your train's going to have a little trouble getting through there. Now, if we change our design so that there are now three inches between the top of our lower helix turn plywood to the bottom of our upper turn helix plywood, as you can see here, we now have 0.41 inches between the top of our rolling stock to the bottom of the plywood here. This gives us enough working room in case of a derailment, but not really all that much to stick your fingers in there. And you'll also notice over here that the distance between the top of this railhead to the top of this railhead is now three and a half inches. And that means this, if we now have three inches from the top of the plywood on the lower turn to the bottom of the plywood on the next turn up, that increases it to three and a half inches from railhead to railhead, and that makes the total rise of our helix 14 inches. And because we stuck with 24 inch radius track, it now increased our grade from 2% to 2.3%. And we'll go over that a little bit more in the next video. So now say we want more finger room than 0.41 inches and we want to change our spacing to four inches. It's now going to look like this. So now we have four inches from the top of the plywood on our lower turn to the bottom of the plywood on our upper turn. And that's increased our room over here between the top of our rolling stock to the bottom of this piece of plywood to 1.41 inches. So now you've really got some working room to get in here. But with four inch spacing, it now increases the distance from the top of the railhead to top of railhead to four and a half inches. And that means we have now made our helix have a total rise of 18 inches. So now we're six inches over what we originally designed for. And also keeping with that 24 inch radius, we increased our grade to 3%. Now, I went and I looked online at what people recommend for spacing between levels of a multi-level layout, and the answer was, well, there is no real answer. It's obviously whatever you want or need to do to build your railroad. Okay, I think we've covered enough for this video, and I hope it made sense. Join me in the next one, and we'll discuss taking into consideration the diameter of the helix turn versus grade versus height. And that should turn out to be the fight of the century. So we'll see you next time.